Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Bokoris. Welcome to the Saints and Struggles podcast, brought to you by Carry Your Cross, the podcast where we journey into the inspiring stories of saints and the incredible struggles they faced. In this first episode, we venture into the life of Saint Padre Pio, a champion of the church who throughout his life dealt with many different struggles. Between his stigmata, lifelong illnesses, a time where he was shuttered away from public ministry and intense demonic attacks from the devil himself, Padre Pio had a life full of twists, turns, and crosses on his way to heaven. We are also joined by Vera Marie Calandra, who received an incredible life-saving miracle from Padre Pio while he was still alive. We will hear that story today. We're also joined by some more incredible guests. Nicholas Salkowski, Communications Director for the National Center of Padre Pio. And Father William Wagner, ORC, Order of Canons Regular of the Holy Cross, who brought an incredible in-depth theological viewpoint to our discussion today. Thank you for being here, and welcome to this very special first episode of the Saints and Struggles podcast. Today we are joined by some incredible guests and experts as we kick off the podcast uh, with the Hall of Fame Catholic and very popular saint, uh, my favorite saint, Saint Padre Pio. Almost 50 years ago, the Calandra family founded the National Center for Padre Pio after their own daughter was miraculously healed by the Blessed Saint. Now recognized by the Holy See for its work, the National Center continues to spread the message of the life, wounds, words, and works of Padre Pio. The goal of the National Center for Padre Pio is to lead souls to God through the example of Padre Pio, the first priest in history to bear the stigmata, the wounds of Christ. Uh, Today, we are pleased to be joined by uh, Vera Marie Calandra, Vice President of the National Center for Padre Pio, and uh, Nicholas Salkowski, Communications Director, uh, and a very special guest, Father William Wagner, ORC, Order of Canons Regular of the Holy Cross. Uh, Thank you all so much for being here, uh, and welcome to this very special first episode of the Saints and Struggles podcast. You're very welcome, Andrew. Thank you for having us. Um, If I could share briefly. uh, So as you know, we've had quite a a bit of struggles trying to get this, this accomplished. Uh, You know, we've even right up to today. So truly the, the, we're in the midst of our novena to Padre Pio here at the center in honor of his feast day, which comes up on September 23rd. And we here at the center find that this time every year, the devil really comes out to play. Um, and I would certainly say that he had a hand in, in making this as challenging as it's been to, to enable us to get all together here. Um, but I do, I do thank you for your, your perseverance, patience with us. And we, uh, we look forward to, to speaking with you today and um, hopefully giving the listeners a little bit of insight about Padre Pio that perhaps they didn't have before. Uh, you gave us a beautiful introduction. You, you covered who we are. Our mission here at the National Center for Padre Pio is to bring souls to God through the intercession of Padre Pio. Um, we are in the midst of our largest event of the year, the Novena to St. Pio, as I said, leading up to his feast day. Um, so this is really a good time for us to, to be on here to talk with you. Definitely. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, so I think where, where it would be great to start off is, is um, just a quick backstory of who is Padre Pio, right? Who is St. Padre Pio? Um, I have done a, a bunch of research on, on St. Padre Pio over the past uh, couple months here and have read some books and um but I know as, as you all being the experts, I definitely want to, um, to welcome the information um, that I may not know and our audience may not know as well. Um, but just to kick it off, uh, Padre Pio was born May 25th, 1887 uh, in Italy as Francesco Forgioni. Um, and he, as a young boy, he always wanted to be a priest, um, actually entered the seminary at age 15, uh, where he took the name of Padre Pio. I think there's a lot of interesting aspects of Padre Pio's life at a very young age, you know, having visions very early on, 
always being able to see his guardian angel. How can we set the scene for the young Padre Pio uh, for the audience here? So I think you did it very well. Um, they lived on a farm. Padre Pio's family was very poor. Um, he also was not, for lack of a better term, very intelligent. So when he expressed an interest in becoming a priest, um, his parents took him to uh, a monastery to meet some Franciscan priests. And they were very happy to have such a, ch- a young child or a young, a young man, a young boy that wanted to become a priest, but they were frank with his parents. You know, he was, he was going to need um, some, some extra attention with his studies in order to, to be able to move forward with them. Um, his father, who saw that he had such great devotion to this, and this is something that his son really wanted to do, set out to do the best that he could by his son to be able to have that come to pass. So his father actually came to America to work and for years worked and sent money back to his family in Pietro China uh, so that they could afford private tutoring for Francesco to, to get his uh, academics up to where they needed to be so that he could go forward into the life, into the priesthood. And prior to that, as Nicholas said, the struggles with Padre Pio's life, even from a very, very young child, um, Padre Pio was taunted by the devil. And yes. that's from um, things, I think Padre Pio started noticing that he had a calling, but Padre Pio never wanted to be noticed as someone special. Mm. And that is when his struggles began, and I believe his endurance also um, to make this happen and come together. And Padre Pio was in uh, many different seminaries. And like Nick said, uh, he also had health is- issues from a very young age. So when he entered the seminary, he was sick. When he was called into the military, or all Italians are called into the military um, men. And he mm-hmm. could not even do the duration there of his military time. He was taken out of the military because of uh, bronchitis and pneumonia. Um, so the Padre Pio struggled basically all throughout his life with different Ill- illnesses plus attacks from the devil. Go to the parallel case of St. Therese of Lisieux. Mm-hmm. She basically went through the dark night of the senses when she was about eight to 10 years old. At that period, her entire educational, they have her coursework, was very mediocre. We're having Father Pio having deep experiences with his angel from the time of five years of age. The spiritual battle is going on there. I'm more versed with just reading his spiritual literature. He's very lucid. He could have been an excellent theologian, both mystical and moral theology. He's very Mm -hmm. well versed and very well read. So I just put the question mark if this modest intelligence is not also kind of a a parallel uh, phenomenon which appears exteriorly to the deep transformations which are already taking place in the, the heart of that child. It was very interesting. Yeah. Doesn't reflect that he was a mediocre student. Yeah, yeah, very interesting take. Well, there's a part of the um, of the book here that I'd love to read um, real quickly and, and get your thoughts on this, and, and we'll jump to the next section um, in his life. Uh, but as he's Padre Pio is, is wrestling with this idea of going to seminary, um, and it's actually at the end of 1902 where this happens. Um, at the end of December 1902, while he was meditating on his vocation, Francesco uh, Francesco had a vision. Several years later, he wrote a description of this vision for his confessor. He used the third person to describe it as if he were an outsider to it. Francesco beheld a majestic man of rare beauty at his side, resplendent as the sun. This man took him by the hand and encouraged him by saying, come with me, for you must fight like a valiant warrior. He was led to a vast field where he was a, a multitude of men divided into two groups. On one side, he saw men of the most beautiful countenance, dressed in snow-white garments. On the other side, he saw men of horrendous aspect, dressed in black garments and looked like dark shadows. The young man who stood in the middle of these two groups of men saw a man coming up to him with a horrible face. He was so tall that he seemed to touch the clouds. The resplendent man by his side exhorted him to fight the monstrous-looking man. Francesco begged to be rescued from the furor of that airy man. But the shining man at his side would not agree to it. 
Your every resistance is in vain. You must fight him. Take heart. Enter confidently into the battle. Go forth with courage. I will be at your side. I will help you, and I won't let him kill you. So really an incredible, uh, incredible um, quote there uh, from Padre Pio, uh, Padre Pio's letter. Father, what do, you, what do you take from that as being an expert on the angels and, and visions and things like that? The thing that comes out to me in that anecdote is, is that he's going to enter this battle. It's, we live it today, so it's more, it's very realistic to do a fight between good and evil. And it's not just the spiritual world, but it's the spiritual persons who enter into league with them. So we're talking about the synagogue of Satan active in the world. And, and the children of the dark are a little more brighter and getting things together than the children of light. So it seems to be a losing battle. But the angel says he's there. He's going to be protecting him. He's not going to let the, the bad guy take him down. Yeah. <laughs> he say about all the suffering that he's going to have to go through. Mm. And so we, we, we've got the weapon of prayer. The angel of Adam was telling the children, but sacrifice too. And I think that's where the children of light need the most help. And that's why Padre Pio, he's, he's the great exa example and model for drawing people to God. But he's also trying to awaken us for a love for the priesthood and the need to pray for priests. They're the ones, it's like in, in Vietnam, the, the, the armies of the modern world shoot the officers and the medics. Yeah. Uh, that's the yeah. target. And the, the, the infantry, which is the laity, uh, they have to be made aware of the great spiritual need for priests and religious. And then all of us in our comfort culture, we have to get back. Our principal weapon is our willingness to sh share, give ourselves to Christ and fill up in our flesh the sufferings that are wanting for his, his church, mm -hmm. the body of the church. And, and that's where victory is going to lie. Amen. That's beautiful. So why with the uh, with with the time that we have, obviously there's so much so much to get into here. But why don't we move into um, where he does go into the seminary? Um, and so Padre Pio enters the seminary. He has a very difficult uh, first year um, as a novitiate, living as a poor brother, uh, often in silence. He's fasting very often. Um, even you know his mattress consisted of a wood frame and a mattress filled with corn husks. Um, very uncomfortable living situations. Um, for the brothers at that time. And um, for, for the people that don't know, novitiate to ordination um, is a time of formation, but it's also a time where, um, where, where brothers, you know, spend a lot of time in, in, in prayer and um, in contemplation and trying to understand if this is the right path for them to be on. Um, and it really, a, a, as Padre Pio gets through that first year, this is when the illnesses begin to come up. Um, and he has this sickness in seminary um, that stays with him for a very, very long time, um, which is a huge suffering in, in, in his life and was almost nobody could really the, the doctors couldn't even explain what was happening to him. Um, Nick or, or Vera, what what can we get into about his sickness here that um, that I think would be interesting for the viewers to know? So his illnesses, um, really all of them, as you had said earlier, they started at such a young age and they really persisted throughout his life. Um, so he kept, as uh, Vera stated earlier, he was he was drafted into the Italian army at one point while he was um, as a priest and they kept sending him back. They kept every time he would go, um, he would go, he would get sick, they would send him back. He would go, he would get sick, they would send him back. Uh, but while some people would have seen these illnesses as um, uh, almost as if our Lord, oh, my God, why are you forsaking me? Or why have you forsaken me? Um, it, it really turns out that Padre Pio, uh, not only Padre Pio, but a lot of people attributed these illnesses. Uh, one, he was able to offer them up and use his sufferings to save souls, but it kept him off the battlefield. It, it, every time he had to come back from the war and was back at his friary, um, it lessened his likelihood of having problems out on the battlefield. And ultimately, the good that he was able to do because of these illnesses and of these sicknesses that kept calling him back, um, it truly it is miraculous the way that they were able to, um, that he was able to, to help all these people. The sickness, these illnesses were a big part of that. But there's also this dimension, which is even in spiritual thought, theology is not well de developed, but there are actually three nights of the soul. 
Curse is the dark night of the senses where the soul is purified and cleansed and weaned so that it be more and more receptive to infused contemplation. Then comes the second night, which is more spiritual, and it's the purification of faith, hope, and charity. So Peter confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, but when the question of the cross comes up, Peter resists it. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Uh, you think the thoughts of man and not the thoughts of God. So that even with our faith, if we're not cleansed, we're going to be constantly throwing in our human reflection and diverting that from its finality. The final, uh, and that's, that is purifies the intellect and the will, the final dark night of this, for, that prepares for the mystical marriage, which Padre Pio enjoys very early, is the life principle where the body is united to the soul. And that to suffer that, the soul has to be brought into, into the proximity of death and constantly be giving itself to God. So while it had these other practical values of keeping him off the battlefield, it's actually intensifying his own union and his transformation. And that will become then after the spiritual marriage, his principle sharing in the sufferings of Christ or the salvation of the soul. Mm. Yeah, I mean, such a common theme through Padre Pio's life and, you know, a quote attributed to him being that the Christian's motto is the cross. You will recognize God's love by this sign, by the sufferings he sends you. And it's such a hard teaching, right. For, for people today um, to, to understand that and to really, um, you know, believe that of why would God give me suffering? And, and, and that is, you know, that is out of love. Uh, but then we look at his own son um, and, and we see the, you know, the reflection there. Um, it, it really is truly amazing, uh, especially all the pain that he, that Padre Pio went through. So I'll share a story. We were talking about this right before we jumped on with the call. Um, and father pointed out, it's, it's interesting for as, so Padre Pio was, was always known as he lived in two worlds. It was often said about him. He lived mm -hmm. in, here with us, but then he also had one foot in the spiritual world. And it's really amazing to think that someone like that can still be, just as frustrated or, or aggravated as, as normal people, people like us. Uh, in 1959, the Pilgrim Virgin of, Stat of Fatima statue was in San Giovanni Rotunda. Padre Pio was very ill uh, with um, what would be bronchial pneumonia. Now, at that time, you know, um, there really wasn't much that they could do about that. He was very sick. He was bedridden. Couldn't get out of bed. The statue was in San Giovanni Rotondo and Padre Pio was frustrated that he could not go and see Our Lady. Um, in, in fact, he, he yelled at her, you're here and I can't, you, you have not healed me so that I can even come and see you and be with you. Um, well, she was suspended by a helicopter. Uh, the pilot of the helicopter, as they were getting ready to leave the city, Never really explained why, but he brought the statue around to Padre Pio's cell, the friary over top of over top of the cell, so that Padre Pio could see her from the window, and he was immediately cured of of his illness. So, as I find that to be um, very endearing and very humanizing about him, that he was frustrated. Um, he almost yelled at, at his mother, at, at the Blessed Mother, and then she, she listened to him. She came around to see him, and then she helped him, as mothers do. It was like a, why have you forsaken me? You are here, and I am ill, and you are leaving me, and I am ill still. Mm -hmm. And that is when, for unexplained reasons, the helicopter made a circle and came back, and Pedro Pio was able to, with assistance, get to the window. And that is one of the famous pictures of Pedro Pio crying. When he's holding a handkerchief, waving uh, to a lady, a white hanky, with yeah. the tears coming down his face. I mean, the, you see the picture, but you don't know the story behind the picture. And that's when he just, he is, Mia Mamina, yeah. my mother, and why have you left me this way? And then after that, after the past, he was well. I mean, it's it, it's pretty emotional to even think about it. It, it almost brings back, you know, Christ's words, uh, or the, or, or not Christ's words, but in the Bible when, when they say, and then Jesus wept, right. It just brings the, it brings that human humanization to this like mystical figure of Padre Pio who would, you know, it, it is pretty amazing. 
lot of the books on Padrino does bring him into our world, into the human, yeah. world, not just the saintly world. And that is why here at the center, we get all denominations, not just Catholic Interesting. faith that comes through here because they can express or relate to Padre Pio, who, as Nick said, lived in both worlds. And he was very much in the human world. And there's always something in Padre Pio's life that any faith can relate to. Right, Nicholas? Yep, it's very true. It's very yes. true. Uh, one of the things that he was known for, and, and I know this really isn't about <laughs> suffering per se, but it just continues to humanize someone like this. Um, he was known for his sense of humor. He had a tremendous sense of humor. Um, so it doesn't, w- with a lot of these saints, but with Padre Pio in particular, it certainly was not always, you know, sadness and suffering. A lot of his life was, but he always saw it as one, a way that he, he was helping others. And, and two, something that was necessary. He saw that it was necessary as he also knew sort of where the world was going. Padre Pio and the U.S. soldiers. The soldiers had many stories after they came back and served Padre Pio's mass. Um, our, our soldiers that helped build the road, paved the road um, up to San Giovanni, up to the monastery, when it was nothing more than dirt and stone for, for horses and carriages. And it was our soldiers that put the road in because they actually went to see who to seek out this monk on the mountain. Who mm-hmm. was this Padre Pio? And Padre Pio took them in and enjoyed their company. And many of them came back with stories of, you know, Padre Pio at the altar and Padre Pio's feet were never on the ground during the holy sacrifice <laughs> of the mass. So there's different aspects from everyone who's doesn't mean they were all Catholic soldiers over there. Staying on that really quickly, it's really interesting to know that there's a lot of other denominations that come or even other faiths that come and learn about Padre Pio. But how can you learn this? How can you learn his story and not say, you know, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. Why, how can I not believe what he believed and, and, you know, really convert because of that? Padre Pio has a way of softening people's hearts, softening their heart, softening their soul. And with that, you open your mind. Just a few weeks ago, and Nicholas um, actually passed the email on to me from a gentleman who heard whose friend he was working out with, and and he said, you know, Vera, can can we come to the center? Can we meet you? Um, Can you bring a special relic to see this gentleman? He is dying, and that leads you into graces come in all forms, not Mm -hmm. just always the healing that we want or that we are praying for, but in different ways. So met with this gentleman and his friend, and he was Indian. The man was Indian, really had no faith. And he went to his friend, the one who contacted Nicholas through email. And he said, you know, I'm dying. Tell me about this God you pray to. And what can you do to help me? Wow. Okay. And he emailed back, his friend did die, but he died in peace. Hmm. He did not die struggling. And his wife, who I believe the visit was more for, who was Catholic, is Catholic. And she had more of a meeting with myself and the gentleman who brought them than the sick dying man. He actually seemed more at peace. It was the wife herself who was more frustrated during that meeting and hammered questions at me. Wow. It's like someone sick is used as an instrument. To bring someone who doesn't even know what's going on or why they're even there, again, back closer to God. And like I said, this gentleman was thinking, he, I don't even, you don't get into that. We don't ask, you know, what religion are you? And, you know, yeah. that's yep. really none of our business. That's between them and God or them and Padre Pio or them and the gentleman that brought them. You know, the instrument, the vehicle, it's always someone who brings someone else here or just a curiosity seeker to try to defame Padre Pio the way they did when he was on earth. Go ahead, Nicholas. Very true. We had, we had a visitor here uh, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, she, her job has since moved her on to a different location, but she was also, um, she was, she was uh, Arabic and she was here and came and sat in our chapel every day on her lunch hour. 
um, not a Christian, not a Catholic, knew of Padre Pio just because of Padre Pio's popularity. Um, you, you'd be hard pressed to, to talk to 10 people on the street where at least one of them didn't know about Padre Pio. Uh, but they, uh, she, she came here every day and she learned about Padre Pio and she said, she, I spoke to her. She said that the, the level of peace that she felt when she entered into this building and into the chapel, uh, was unparalleled. And every day she would come on her lunch hour and for probably six, eight months, she was here without fail seven days a week. Wow. That's beautiful. I think we're here at a very deep Christological level here about his humanity, his humor, his sufferings, his anguish. When we go back to early Christianity, it took over four centuries to solidly establish that Jesus Christ is really holy man, body, soul, intellect, will, his emotions. And Padre Pio then, in this, He's bringing the mystery of Christ, and it's been alienated through, through semi-Manichaeanism, the sensuality, everything in us. It's, it's a source of temptation, and therefore, since they're temptations, the faculties are evil, and people end up hating themselves. But it, this is a creature of God, so everything in this creature by nature is good. It needs to be ordered and brought back to God. And God brings us these great saints, and in particular, Padre Pio, with the priesthood, and we have to remember, Jesus Christ is God. We, can't, we don't mythologize him that he's above all of these sufferings of these emotions. It's precisely these emotions which become the vehicle and instrument of grace and communication to us. And we need these saints to bring us back into contact with Jesus of the Gospels and his humanity. We may have taken you a little off track, Andrew, with our questions. Oh, no worries. I mean, this is great. I think this, uh, this is a great conversation. And I think um, it's it's good to hear the the humanity of Padre Pio and even just the events that have happened for with people that have um, have learned about him and have have have, could have may have been converted by him or or things like that. Um, I do want to get into um, a passage here and, and get into the stigmata, which I think is you know obviously one of the most interesting parts of of his life. Padre Pio himself has also left us an account of this event in the form of a letter to his spiritual director, Father Bendetto of San, Mar San Marco in Lamis, dated September 8th, 1911. Yesterday evening, something happened to me that I don't know how to explain or understand. In the middle of the palms of my hands, red spots appeared, almost the size of a penny, accompanied by a sharp, strong pains. The pain was especially sharp in the middle of the left hand, so much so that it continues even now. I also experienced some pain in my feet, this phenomenon dates about a year ago and continues even now. Um, and as we know, Padre Pio um, suffered the stigmata wounds um, uh, of Christ and um, truly an, an incredible phenomenon that I think the, the listeners would, would really like to learn more about and how it affected Padre Pio uh, himself. Well, so Padre Pio did have the stigmata um, actually five wounds so he had hands feet and side and the side wound uh the transverberation of his heart uh, we would go on to find out later after padre pio had died um his heart was actually pierced that happened approximately a month or so before uh the the hand and the feet wound, the hand wounds and the feet wound um Padre Pio was criticized. I mean, many people thought that he had done this to himself. Um, some of them even went so far as... So at that point, the, the Spanish flu was raging in, uh, around the world. Um, Padre Pio was one of the, the, the priests in charge of administering the, the flu shots to, the, uh, to his, his brothers. So he had gone into the local pharmacy... Um, he had ordered, uh, purchased carbolic acid, which they would use to, to, for sterilization purposes. But because records of that existed, there were people who believed that he had self-inflicted these, these wounds. They were bandaged. Um, they bandaged him up for, I believe, eight days. And the, the thought process behind that was that after eight days, if these truly were self-inflicted wounds, if they were not miraculous in nature, we would see some sort of healing. Uh, after eight days, the wounds were undressed and there was no healing of any kind. 
So you couldn't please everybody. There were still people that certainly believed that, that he had done this to himself, that he wasn't right in the head, that he was faking this. But there were others who also got on board with the idea that perhaps this really was real, that Christ had appeared to him and inflicted upon him his own wounds. And Padre Pio bled over a cup of blood a day, and yet his diet consisted on less than what an infant would survive on. Unbelievable. Father, why do you, why do you think Christ would give someone like Padre Pio the stigmata wounds? And what does that symbolize, especially for somebody who's never heard of stigmata before, you know, does no idea what that is um, or how it, it comes to be? Well, it's an excellent question. And the answer has to go back to Christ's will to unite us. He invites those apostles to share with him. Couldn't you watch with me one hour, as Paul talks about, filling up in his own flesh what's lacking? So the merits of Christ need to be completed by a cooperation, a communion of love with the church. And it's very interesting that, as Nicholas points out, he has his heart wound before his hand wounds. So generally, we see this and we think about how much pain he must be feeling. But what is greater is the pain and anguish of souls. And it's the love of these saints. And those the more someone loves the Lord, the more he grants them charism. So we don't choose that. But it's, it's to make the church and the world aware, bring us closer into contact with Christ's suffering through this visual thing, but also the need for dedicating all of our sufferings in this direction to bring about the conversion of souls, our own transformation. And I think that's the deepest thing is, is what are the sufferings of soul, of mind and anguish, of, of affection for people? There's a children of Adam, a sheep, soul's going to hell, and then they're willing to do anything to save her. And that's certainly the case with Padre Pio, just a complete oblation of himself throughout his life and for sinners. Padre Pio was, was asked, you know, what, uh, of all of these wounds, which was the most painful? And one of the things that the people really didn't know, he would answer this question that the most painful of his wounds was his shoulder. Uh, he was also permitted by our Lord to feel the, the weight of the cross upon his left shoulder the same way that, that Christ carried it. Wow. I, I did not know that. And I just got chills that you just said that. <laughs> um that, that's truly unbelievable. Do you do you feel that many? So there's obviously the people that may have thought that he was faking it, but of, of course there's many others that um, that truly believed in that and, and and flocked to him because of that. Do you feel was that a big reason why people started coming to Padre Pio because of these wounds being such a you know an, an unbelievable sight, even though he did try to hide them? Yes, the phenomena of Padre Pio was that, and also that he could read souls. And especially in confession. What you have to remember, though, is that they they tried to hide this for a very long time. I mean, as, as you know, Padre Pio was forbidden from offering public mass or hearing confessions for, what, three years? Mm-hmm. So he the, they were not sure what to make of this at first. And mm-hmm. then I think they feared what ended up happening was that there was really and truly no way to validate this, right? So if they started purporting that this was the actual stigmata of Christ and people started flocking to San Giovanni Rotundo. And then were they, were they flocking there under deception? So they didn't really know how to handle this at that point. Once the thing, the other thing, some of the other super, supernatural things started occurring around him. Uh, they became more comfortable with the idea that this was in fact legitimate stigmata and they slowly permitted him to resume public ministry. Uh, as Vera pointed out, certainly people started flocking to San Giovanni Rotondo by the thousands. A lot of them with, with good intentions in their hearts, a lot of them also to scam. There were stories of, of people that would, uh, they were selling cloths dipped in chicken blood mm. and saying that this was blood from Padre Pio's wound. So there were a lot of fears by the church at that time as to whether or not this was something that we should we should really advertise and talk about, or should we really just keep this to ourselves for, for the time being. And to me, again, that's also relatable, and Father can understand what they did to the three children in Fatima. Took them out of the public and, you know, kept them locked up until this kind of 
apply it down, right, Father? Yes, that's it. And there we see kind of the bureaucratic side of the church that always wanted to be certain. And But the people, they're seeing the wounds, but they're seeing Christ in him, and they experience that love. And that's where you get the, the divulgation of people are aware of their sinfulness. They're not sure how they stand with God. They can go to confession to this man. He's bleeding for them. And there's this huge outpouring of love which envelops them. Now they know. And they want to share that with others because it's the greatest experience in their life. And at the same time, there's lots of scammers and lots of rowdy people around. But those who, these, the people who have these kind of gifts also receive a super abundance of love. And that's what the, the world needs and each individual needs. And that's his popularity and why it spread, notwithstanding all the efforts to contain this. This confusion, what they thought was a confusion or something. Well, yeah, and and I, it almost sounds like, I mean, this in itself of of the Vatican taking away public ministry for for Padre Pio as it that was probably a huge suffering for him. I mean, not that he wanted the fame or anything. He wasn't very obviously very humble man, but he uh, not being able to do his confessions or do mass much it must have been very difficult. That was, yes, it's extreme suffering, extreme pain, but the greatest act of redemption for Christ is abandonment on cross, and the greatest gift of the Blessed Mother is to surrender herself completely to that. And so in this, Padre Pio demonstrates to superheroic degrees his charity, his obedience, and his humility. And these are the signs which really the Church needs to verify and authenticate. So what may have been a harsh measure, actually gives us greater demonstration of the truth. It's kind of like the doubt of St. Thomas confirms us more in the faith of Christ than if everybody said just hurrah. He he was of the other position, and he comes and experiences the risen Christ, and that helps us, St. Gregory says, more than the faith of the others. Amazing. So there's a couple of different, um, a couple other sections I definitely want to get into with the time that we have. Um, one being, um, one being his demonic attacks, uh, d- d- definitely his entire life being it, but being attacked by the demonic, um, by the devil himself. Um, I have a quick passage I'd like to read here. F- Father Augustino tells us that Satan appeared under various forms to the young priest as a nude woman dancing lewdly as a crucifix, as a young man who was friends of the monks as his spiritual father. The provincial, uh, provincial <laughs> superior, uh, Pope Pius X, his guardian angel, St. Francis, the Virgin Mary, but also as his horrible self with an army of demonic spirits. At times there was no apparition, but the poor priest was beaten until he bled, tormented with deafening noises, covered with spit, etc. He was able to free himself from the torments by calling on the name of Jesus. So, Padre Pio, his whole life, and especially when he became a priest, was tormented terribly um, by the demonic realm. Um, obviously, I mean, this <laughs> he just continues to have more and more sufferings thrown, thrown on him that he needs to endure. Um, Father, what can you tell us about this uh, as a somebody like Padre Pio being attacked by the demonic? Why does something like this happen to him? Again, Padre Pio is charismatic presence of the suffering Christ and the devil has a certain power he was able to seduce Adam and Eve he can tempt people so God he's kind of like a a dog on a chain he can never do anything beyond what God permits but through the fall into sin mankind is in a certain way given the devil a power to act and to deceive, or his great weapon is fear and anxiety. And therefore, we have the great saints who suffer the torments of the devil because they do it not simply as individuals, but as members of the mystical body of Christ. And so through the sufferings and the battles that Padre Pio suffers from the devil, there's also a spiritual force field protecting his spiritual children. And I think that's a key in a lot of the saints. We find it in St. Paul. All the things that he suffered demonstrates his love for Christ. It's a protection for the church and authenticate his mission. 
And so if we can, if we see these things on the spiritual dimension of the mystical body that continues to be in this battle with the enemy until the end of time, until the end of the apocalypse, when Christ finally <clears throat> puts an end to the battle. Incredible. Obviously, Padre Pio's life wasn't all, you know, suffering and 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 sadness and and uh, and pain, but he found joy in this. And and God uh, tells us to to find joy in our suffering. And Saint Paul says this as well: "For rejoice in my sufferings." Um, how can or well, how did Padre Pio find joy in his suffering? Um, and how can people like us as well uh, find joy in our own sufferings, as hard as that can be? Well, that's a very theological question. It's a very, it's an excellent question. First, in Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus Himself looked forward to the joy that awaited Him in heaven, and therefore, humanly speaking, was capable of bearing the ignominy and the sufferings of the cross. So, joy is a fruit of love. The more Padre Pio loves, and the more he remains in that present union with God, even while his body may be tormented. He still has that union with Christ. So take St. Lawrence where they're frying him on the grill. He has enough humor to say, I'm done on this side, turn me over, because of that deep union. And so Padre Pia can be, be wasted with this suffering, and he has that humanity. He's he kind of like a child. The devil's going to beat him up, and he's, he, he's afraid. But at the same time, he has that union with God. And it's an extremely important uh, in our own sufferings. We say, God has left me alone. He's gone away. Never talk like that. God is present to us in our soul. He indwells within us. And the more we can retain that awareness, that's living and thinking the thoughts of faith so that even under stress or difficulties, God is with me. And that's my essential joy. And in that, I can have peace, even while I'm bodily suffering or suffering anguish because of friends suffering or whatever. And that's what, what these big saints are about, is that we can see they're being torn apart and we wouldn't be able to handle that suffer, but they can because of the love that animates them, and unites them to the book. Very well said. That that was amazing. Um, I mean, I think we can all learn, we can truly learn from from Padre Pio in the way that he he dealt with this, and and like you said, Nick, he had such a sense of humor as well on top of this, and um, the love that radiated from him. Um, lastly, I. I, I think we're very lucky today to be joined um, by Vera Marie Calandra, um, who actually had a, an incredible miracle happen uh, to her as a young child. And um, when I heard about this, I had, I had not heard about this story before until I, uh, uh, until I learned of the National Center. And um, Padre Pio has done a, a lot of miracles in his life. Uh, but today we get to learn of the miracle that, that Vera Marie Calandra experienced herself. Uh, which is so amazing to have her on, on the program today. Vera, um, could you give us some background of this amazing story um, and how it affected your, your life, your family's life, and really how it's um, bloomed into what is the, uh, the National Center for Padre Pio today? Sure. It has come about um, with basically a simple promise that my mother made. I am the fifth of six children and was born back in April of 1966 with many um, urological anomalies, as it was called. Um, and I had to have many, many surgeries leading up to the grace that was bestowed or the calling that I say that my mother received. Before I was born about a year or so ago, um, someone had given my mother a book on Padre Pio. And at that time, she didn't need Padre Pio. Again, all related to Padre Pio and his, his lifetime. And she simply put that book on the shelf. You know, what did she need to know? Um, they were a growing family, uh, doing well in life, regular churchgoers. My father owned a, a pretty, pretty famous delicatessen down in Norristown, where we're, we're originally from, um, across from one of the biggest Italian churches um, in Norristown. So we were a very well-known family, I should say. And so they all knew that, you know, Harry and Vera had, my mother's name is Vera also, uh, had a big growing family. And then they also knew that when number five came along, you know, my father started asking his regular daily customers um, for prayers because number five came along very, very sick. 
That being said, after I was born, I was taken right down to Children's Hospital to quote unquote make me comfortable as there was no way I was going to live. Um, that obviously did not happen. And I continued to do well, but of course have setbacks on the daily with every, with every surgery that I had. Um, like I said, we were from Norristown, so I was taken down to Children's Hospital in Philadelphia where there's also a lot of different shrines to saints. So my parents started, you know, shrine hopping because one wasn't listening. You know, one saint wasn't listening or the answers weren't coming because the news from the doctors was just more and more devastating until they finally said at about two and a half years old, we need to remove her bladder because there's truly nothing else we can do. And my mother's response was, how is she going to live without a bladder? And the doctor at the time was actually, after that became the Surgeon General, um, uh, Dr. C. Everett Coop, who was the head of general surgery at CHOP in Philly. And he basically told her that, you know, she's not going to live. This is only to make her more comfortable to live out the rest of her life. Again, the prayers deepened and more prayers from the people that came into the store and the priests and whatnot at the local parish and my mother just decided she had spent all of you know on the local the local saints so to speak um that she remembered the book that someone had given her on this priest that she knew nothing about and she had my sister actually who was born shortly before all this um on her lap and she started reading the book to Padre Pio and a beautiful fragrance came around her head. And she heard the words, bring your little girl to me in Italy and do not delay. And with that, she explained what happened to my father to say, you know, this is a, something that I feel I need to do. She just had my sister, Christina, who was just weeks old. Again, I was two and a half. And... She made the arrangements to the best she could to go over to San Giovanni Rotondo, which, of course, the first stop is in Rome. Not knowing the language in the heat of the summer, I mean, still in Italy to this day, they don't know what ice is or barely air conditioning. Well, imagine it in 1968, August of 1968. But she made her way because with each, again, like what father can, can relate to, with something bad that happened, something good happened. You know, they had to take a train from, well, we had to take a train from Rome to San Giovanni. And on that train with, you know, hundreds of other people, no air conditioning, a window that was barely cracked or that would move to go up and down. Here she was, she was telling, you know, you're calling me here. What do you want from me? I have now two children that are sick. What do you want? And she just kept feeling that calling. And everyone says, you know, that the grace was, the bladder, to me, the grace was her persistence and her blind faith because she didn't know a language. She didn't know where she was going. She knew nothing about this little, what it was called, city on a mountain. And yet she persevered with sick children in tow. And here, out of nowhere, a man came to the side of the window of the train, handed her a bottle of water, which back in Italy in those days, there wasn't bottled water. Of course, now it's all over. And when she turned to say thank you, after grabbing it, this person was nowhere in sight. Did Padre Pio send her someone to, to say, I'm with you, you know, just keep going. So from um, Rome, you get to Foggia and then Foggia, which is at the bottom of Padre Pio's mountain, um, to San Giovanni, you take a taxi. And she went to a little, what you would call these days, like a bed and breakfast kind of a thing. And she had in her, her mind that you called me here, Padre Pio, what do you want from me? I have sick children now, and what do you want? And as Nicholas said, that Padre Pio did after he was put back into the public, he became very, very more popular. And this was closer to um, his, 80th, his 80th birthday. I should say his 80, a little bit past his 81st. And they had a lottery to get to see Padre Pio to go for the masses. 
So you didn't always get into the mass because after mass, when you had to be there at four to five o'clock in the morning, the masses were sometimes two to three hours. A select few were selected to go into a corridor and wait for Padre Pio to go down, to be wheeled through. He was in a wheelchair at that time. And my mother was one of those who got her tickets and went and waited in that corridor. And she had so much she wanted to, you know, to get off her chest. I'm here. You called me. Both of them are very sick, but this one here is dying. The first time through the, through the corridor, my mother, as she puts it, was very, very unimpressed with her meeting with Padre Pio because he, he did stop very briefly, kind of looked at her, touched myself, touched Christina, and just gave my mother a look and kept going. Again, she was very unimpressed. She had a lot now that she wanted to get off. She was an Italian woman on a mission that wanted to let loose on this monk that called her here. So after that, she went back to the monastery and she says, you know, now what do I do? I, I need to see him because I need to speak with him. I still have sick children and this one dying. <clears throat> and she did the next, the next morning, as she said, she was in the last pew in this, in, at the mass. And she's just, she didn't know how from the last pew that she was going to be allowed or be called into that corridor to see Padre Pio. But how Padre Pio worked it, she was. And she was told to wait, kneel down, and wait for the wheelchair to go through. And she just, she had planned on cleaning her mind at that point and just giving it to him. And as she puts it, when he was wheeled through, their eyes locked. And at that moment, she made her promise to Padre Pio, make a miracle so that all will believe. Upon coming back, like two days later, we went back, you know, to Foggia, to Rome, to the airplane. And as she said, there was a lot of people waiting for the crazy lady that bought two sick babies, one dying in the airport to see, you know, if she was dead or alive, you know, what was going on? How did she make it? What were the stories? How was this Padre Pio? And the hospital basically said, if she's alive, when you get home, bring her back. That's all we can do. Shortly after we got home, of course, I was alive and my mother was in the kitchen. And that is when she heard on the news that Padre Pio had died. And that the story came to her full circle with her message of bring your little girl to me and do not delay because she felt that Padre Pio knew he was dying. And if she did not listen out of blind faith, it's very possible none of this would have happened. A few months after that, I was brought back down to Children's Hospital for x-rays. And they says, we don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. Because where we remove the bladder, there is now a bladder. And that is the grace. And after that, May of 1969, she went back over to Italy to say thank you to Padre Pio. Of course, you know, she watched the funeral like millions all around the world on television did. And that is when she told the friars who were in charge at that time that she received her grace. She was there months beforehand. And what can she do to thank Padre Pio, to make Padre Pio known? And eh, in the beginning, they didn't take her so serious. You know, okay, what's this American going to do? She wants to come over here. We'll give her a few prayer cards. But then she went back year after summer after summer. And we spent the summers there learning about Padre Pio, getting to know the friars, teaching them English, us learning Italian. And so the work began of her going around doing her talks back in the 70s. And um, she toured, toured, went on uh, around the world, around the U.S., and even over to the Philippines, to Sri Lanka, to talk about Padre Pio, about the grace that was received in the family, and to teach people that graces do come in many, many forms. And her thank her, her Thanksgiving grew from there. And yes, it was a following. People say they, they were following her, but she was doing what she set out to do. 
bringing souls to God through Padre Pio, the way she learned. And that is how from Narstown at a kitchen table to a sun porch to another property to where we're at now on the 106th uh, acre campus with the Spirituality Center, the replica of, of Our Lady of Grace Chapel, uh, to the museum and everything that we have to offer to the people that basically come from all over the world, right, Nick? They do. In fact, we're, we, got, we have visitors from all over the country uh, just today. Um, we have them here from California. We have them here from New York. We have them here from Wisconsin just today as part of our, our Novena to Padre Pio. Uh, we do, we get people from um, all over Europe, Mexico. We had a king from Africa a few years back. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, Farah, thank you so much for that testimony and the, you know, the beautiful story. Um, and it, it, it truly is incredible. Uh, and uh, so thank you so much uh, for, for giving that story and that testimony. I was the recipient, but I believe my mother received a miracle because if she did not listen, you know, again, yeah. faith. Like Father said, everything is really based on our faith. And yes. her blind faith brought her to San Giovanni. Yeah. Well, I think what's so amazing is that, the, you know, when we th think about the saints, so many of us think, you know, so long ago, there he's, he can't relate. Like, this was not that long ago. You know, the, he, 1968. Yeah. 1968, it, it, he walked this earth and, and is still doing miracles today. Yes. Um, incredible. So I think that's a good, you know, a, a good way to end this, end this podcast in a, in a beautiful story like that. Um, where can our listeners learn more about uh, the center and the, the amazing work that you are all doing? We receive mail and calls, like Nick said, from all over the world. Um, when people are come here, and they want to learn either we get bus groups or just small families or individuals um, we do our best to take our time to teach people uh, the museum is full of relics and replicas of uh, the different hope of Pedro Pio's life like his cell in San Giovanni um, but yes all of the articles that you see in the museum are all authentic because of the work we did and extensively for so many years the friars have uh, entrusted the Calandra family solely with the relics, the belongings of Padre Pio's that you do see. So the family has them on loan here to the center. And it gives more for the people, again, to see like Padre Pio's cereal bowl, his yeah. Italian playing cards that are, you know, and that's, again, that's the human side of Padre Pio. That's very relatable, the artifacts, wouldn't you say, yeah. that we have up in the museum. Certainly. And where can our listeners, um, is there a, a website that they can go to in order to sign up for these tours or, or what is the best place for them to go? Sure. So you can go, they can go right to PadrePio.org um, and they can, they can uh, take a, like a virtual tour of, of the spirituality center, see some pictures from inside of the museum, see some of the things that we have on display here. We don't give it all away online. We do want people to, to certainly make the pilgrimage here. Um, but it's a good place to start. There's plenty of information about Padre Pio. Um, you can email us directly, uh, info at padrepio.org. They come to me. I'm happy to, to answer any questions that anybody has. We uh, also accept your prayer intentions. Um, every, all the prayer intentions that we receive via email or phone call or postal mail, we place them all upon a relic of Padre Pio, and all who contact us seeking prayer are remembered in our daily prayers here at the center and all of the masses that we have here. So I do encourage everyone who, who's listening to this, who has some curiosities, come check us out online and potentially come and see us in person. Amazing. Well, Nick, Vera, Father William, thank you so much for the time today. Um, I, I, hopefully this sparks uh, more interest in Padre Pio in his life and, and brings more people um, to Jesus Christ through, uh, through Padre Pio and his intercession today. Um, so thank you so much for the time. Thank You're you for having welcome. us. You're very welcome.